Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Jason Lyle, Assistant Professor of Political Science at Yale University. His research focuses on the dynamics of violence in both conventional and guerrilla warfare, with special emphasis on Afghanistan and Russia's Northern Caucasus, particularly Chechnya. Professor Lyle's work draws on diverse methods ranging from historical and cross-national comparisons to field and quasi-experiments at the sub-national and local level. His research has been published in the American Political Science Review, International Organization, Journal of Conflict Resolution, and World Politics. Today we'll speak with him about his article that's forthcoming in the American Political Science Review titled, Are Co-Ethnics More Effective Counterinsurgents? Evidence from the Second Chechen War. Welcome, Professor Lyle. Thank you. Your paper looks at whether or not ethnicity matters um, in looking at violence during civil wars. Give us an overview of your paper. Absolutely. Yes, the broad central question is really, does ethnicity matter for explaining patterns of violence in civil wars? Mm -hmm. And what we're really interested in here is explaining how insurgents attack, where they attack, whom they attack, the spatial distribution of that, the patterns over time. And the Second Chechen War allows us to get a window into that particular process because the patterns have been so dynamic and mm -hmm. so uh, varied across time. And so what I've done with this particular paper, is, which is part of a larger project looking at the whole Northern Caucasus, is to look at patterns of violence since the Second Chechen War, which began in the fall of 1999. It is still ongoing to this day, although very much at a reduced level. Mm -hmm. And what this uh, paper is really looking at is how uh, the insurgents have responded to Russian aggression against villages and pro-Russian Chechen soldiers who have come from the insurgency to side with the Russians against their own people, mm -hmm. how the insurgents respond to them as well. Okay. And what led you to write this paper? Uh, this is actually part of a broader series of papers that is being funded by the United States Institute of Peace. Mm -hmm. And the Northern Caucasus as a whole, it offers, uh, I hate to use the word a laboratory, but a very nice way of looking at a whole series of these conflict processes as they unfold. The region, which I think is unfamiliar to many, uh, to many viewers perhaps, but is one of the most varied on earth in terms of ethnicity, in terms of geography. It has everything from low plains to vast hills. Mm -hmm. uh, it has uh, mono-ethnic republics in it. It has uh, very, very diverse uh, republics within it. Uh, most of them are Muslim. Uh, but they have very, very different patterns of, of violence across them. Some are neighboring each other, have no violence. Uh, one, for example, Dagestan is incredibly violent. You'll move over slightly. Chechnya, again, incredibly violent, but totally different patterns of violence. Mm -hmm. You move over to a third and farther west, almost no violence. And then it picks up as we move farther west and, and new patterns of violence. So the region as a whole offers this very interesting way of looking into this and saying, why are these patterns occurring? And I think we don't understand uh, these patterns generally across civil wars. Mm -hmm. And so this offers one way, which is neatly compact, put together geographically. The Russian is the language across all of them. Uh, so they have a common heritage, but yet this unique diversity. So we can look at and begin to test and, and, and experiment and use our theories to try and test and say, what is going on here? What can we shed light on not just these conflicts, but also broader patterns of violence elsewhere? Okay, and let's talk about your methodology. How did you gather the data for your paper? Uh, this actually is, uh, we like to say as political scientists, of course, that we have a master plan and everything falls into mm -hmm. place uh, perfectly. This not so much. Uh, this actually came through luck, uh, believe it or not. I was a graduate student in Moscow in St. Petersburg when the war first began, mm -hmm. and I was doing interviews with policymakers and military officials. Chechnya was not on my radar screen at this time, and in fact, most people's it was not, simply mm -hmm. because uh, the, the censorship regime around the war was very, very tight, and you couldn't get much information on it. And I was coming home one night on the Moscow Metro, half asleep from an interview, and I happened to notice that someone had stuck a placard over uh, one of the windows mm -hmm. saying that there was going to be an anti-Chechen war protest uh, the following night. This is very hard for people to organize. This is Putin, and we have to remember at the time, cracking down on civil society, cracking down on uh, media outlets. So someone had started distributing leaflets within the metro stations, and so people who were on the, the trains could see. Mm -hmm. And I said, this sounds like a good opportunity. I think I'll go and see, and see what happens if people protest. And I subsequently did that for the following four and a half years on and off, mm -hmm. viewing uh, these anti-war activists, and I got to know them. And their key means of getting information out around the blockade was to hand out a little broadsheet that had daily records of abuses inflicted by Russian soldiers and by Chechen insurgents during the war by day, essentially. And then they would give out a weekly broadsheet. 
And then no one was interested. The passerby would just, would just leave it. But I was interested because this said to me that there were data, that there mm -hmm. were people collecting it, courageous people collecting it. Sure. And I wondered if I could get my hands on that and I essentially help actually understand what's going on on a data-by-day -day level by taking these documents. So a lot of the data came from human rights groups. They came from uh, activists. They came from journalists who were still working in the region, mm -hmm. mostly Russian language sources. And then from that, we just compiled it all into one big data set and then mm -hmm. began to ask the questions. Wow, okay. Why is it important to look at ethnicity during wartime violence? So ethnicity, to some, is the holy grail of explaining patterns of violence. Mm -hmm. uh, almost everything reduces down to it. And many people you ask and say, could you explain Rwanda? Could you explain Bosnia? Could you explain Iraq today mm -hmm. without ethnicity? And most people would say no. Iraq looks like a Sunni Shia civil war, the, or the uh, Tutsi and the Hutu in Rwanda. How could you explain it without that? It explains who is being killed, when they're being killed, the actual location. If we look at intermixed populations, it's typically the fault lines for the war. Others, however, say ethnicity matters not a bit mm -hmm. because identity is the product of the war, not the cause of it. Okay. So there's a really interesting debate about whether it's actually doing anything at all or doing everything at, at, at once. And the position I take in this paper is that's probably somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. And what we really want to do is be able to test it. Because what I think what we can do in explaining it is not just where the violence occurs and whom is victimized, but also uh, that the violence itself, the responses to it, are conditional on the identity of the perpetrator. And this is something our theories don't really talk about. We just assume violence is a, a violent act is a violent act. Mm -hmm. But in fact, it matters whom is inflicted and on whom. Okay. And so ethnicity, I think, unlocks that. And if we can get our hands on figuring out whom is doing what to whom, we can actually explain a lot more of the dynamics of the violence. Okay, and let's talk a little bit more about the conclusions you reach in your paper. Absolutely. Uh, the main conclusion, interestingly enough, is that the Chechen rebels, who were once rebels, who have now sided with the Russians, are much more effective counterinsurgents than the Russians are themselves. And why is that? Well, they come from the same uh, communities, basically. Mm -hmm. The Russians actually oftentimes will put them back to where they were born okay. or where they were recruited from, and they know the people. Mm -hmm. And so they know who the insurgents are. And if they can't find the insurgents, they know who the families are. So they know, essentially, whom to threaten and who to actually go into the villages and identify and say, you're an insurgent, you're coming with us. Uh, the Russians don't. They typically don't have the language skills. Most Russians don't speak Chechen. Mm -hmm. Most uh, Russian soldiers are 18-year-old conscripts. They don't have much time in there. They're very poorly paid. They don't want to be there. Mm -hmm. And so the Russians, when they come through, typically brutalize, but brutalize on a, on a large scale, and they don't actually know who the insurgents are. Mm -hmm. The Chechens, when they come through, know whom to brutalize, essentially. And so they come through, and they find the insurgents, and they remove them from the population. And so over time, one of the main conclusions is as the Russians sweep, the villages. They come through and they do these operations to pull the insurgents out. Uh, the violence goes up mm -hmm. after the, the Russians leave. When the Chechens of comparable size and comparable level of brutality towards the population come through, the violence drops dramatically. So we get a net reduction of about 40% wow. in subsequent levels of insurgent violence once the Chechens are sweeping their own people. Mm -hmm. and so that's one of the main conclusions. The second is that this is an incredibly dangerous policy to be practicing because what you're essentially doing is arming communities within the community that you're trying to control and setting them at odds against one another. And that says nothing for the post-war stability. Mm -hmm. So the Russians have bought a measure of peace right now by essentially turning the Chechens against themselves. Once the Russians withdraw, they've essentially armed the Chechen communities into at least four little groups, each with weapons, each ready to scrap for the turf once the Russians leave. So short term this seems to be effective, although very brutal. Uh, in the long term, this may be sowing the seeds for a future conflict. And I think this is actually a conclusion that travels. This is the same thing the United States is trying to do in Afghanistan today with the Afghan militia. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing the United States did in Iraq, for example, with the Sons of Iraq movement, where he armed local militia because they were better at counterinsurgency than the, incoming, uh, the incumbent, the United States, or in this case, the Russians. And then it just creates trouble down the road. Absolutely. I mean, I think this is something we don't actually know about, is what are the long-term implications mm -hmm. of this? Uh, but my suggestion for Chechens is they're probably not good. Right, right. What was the most surprising thing you found in doing research for this paper? Perhaps the most surprising thing was that I could actually do it. Mm -hmm. uh, when I started the project, many people said there will be no data. This is a heavy censorship regime. The Russians do not want you there. They do not want information to come out, and they control the television and most of the print right. media. So this is very hard to get information. Uh, but the human rights groups, and Memorial is one of the big human rights groups, have found ways around the censorship network, uh, ways to get on the internet, ways to actually have email access into the, their spotters on the ground in Chechnya. And we have much more information than we ever thought possible. 
And I think the thing that's even most uh, uh, encouraging in some ways and surprising is that now we can go on to the web and download hundreds of pages of testimony mm -hmm. by Russians who have been victim, uh, excuse me, by Chechens who have been victimized. And the appearing Court of Human Rights, for example, has collected all of this, and there's hundreds of pages of this online. So more and more data every day is becoming available, and I think down the road that scholars will have even better understanding of what's going on. So I think it's surprising and encouraging how much we know about a place that people don't want us to know about in the first place. And all thanks to the internet in many, in many regards and being people being able to post information. That's amazing, actually. Absolutely, yes. They've been very creative at finding workarounds, yeah. blogs. Uh, in some cases, they've encrypted their emails so mm -hmm. that they can't be read by the Russian uh, intelligence apparatus who is monitoring these activities. Uh, a lot of courage and a lot of creativity, sure. and, and, and they've done a, they've shone a light on a very dark corner, okay. I think. Okay. Very interesting. Thanks so much for being here with us today and sharing some of your work. Thank you very much. For more information about Professor Lyle and his work, please visit our website at yale.edu backslash Macmillan Report. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale.